All right, greetings and salutations. My name is Comic Fire, and we are getting back to the dramatic reading of The Edge Chronicles Beyond the Deep Woods. It's been 11 months. Sorry. <laughs> so, let's pick up where we left off on page, tw uh, page 96. <clears throat> Twig stared at the goblin open mouth. Why did you do that? he said. But the goblin left without saying a word. Twig slumped to the floor. Horrible little beast, he muttered. Others came with their loads of roots, fruits, berries, and leaves. None of them noticed Twig. None of them heard him pleading for something to eat. Eventually, Twig fell silent and stared down at the sticky floor. The stream of goblins dwindled. It was only when a latecomer arrived, grumbling to himself about the time, that Twig looked up again. The goblin looked flustered. His hand shook as he tipped his load of succulent yellow tub roots down the hole. At last, he said. Now for some food. Food! Food! The wonderful word echoed round Twig's head. He leapt up and followed the goblin. Two right turns and a left fork later, Twig found himself in a vast cavernous chamber. It was round and high and domed, with glistening walls and thick pillars like dripping candles. The air was cloying with the familiar sickly sweet smell and sticky on the skin. Although packed, the chamber was quite still. The guile goblins were all staring upwards, open mouthed and wide eyed at a point in the very center of the domed ceiling. Twig followed their gaze and saw a wide tube slowly descending. Clouds of pink steam billowed out from its end, making the stuffy air more stifling still. The tube came to a halt above a trough. The goblins held their breath as one. There was a click and a gurgle, a final puff of steam, and all at once a torrent of thick pink honey poured out from the bottom of the tube and into the trough. At the sight of the honey, the goblins went wild. Voices were raised, fists flew! Those at the back surged forward while those at the front fought with each other. They scratched, they scraped, they tore at one another's clothes in a frenzied effort to be the first at the steaming pink honey. Twig drew back away from the rioting goblins. He felt behind him for the wall and worked his way around the outside of the chamber. And when he came to a flight of stairs, he climbed it. Halfway to the top, he stopped, sat and looked at, down at the goblins. The pink honey was splashing and splattering everywhere as goblins struggled to get as much of the gooey mixture as they could. Some were slurping from their cupped hands. Some had plunged their heads into the sticky mess and were gulping it down in greedy mouthfuls. One had jumped into the trough and was lying directly under the tube with its mouth open. A look of mindless contentment spread over his spattered features. And here's a picture of the, uh, of this whole going down, Minus. Twig shook his head in disgust. All at once there was a loud clunk, and the stream of pink honey stopped. The feeding time was over. A half-hearted groan went up and several of the goblins clambered into the trough to lick it clean. The rest began to file away, calmly, peacefully. Along with their hunger, the frantic atmosphere had also disappeared. The chamber was all but empty when Twig climbed to his feet. He paused. There was another noise. It went. And again. Puff, pant, squelch, clatter. Heart pounding, Twig spun round and peered up into the darkness above him. He fingered his amulus nervously. Puff, pant, squelch, clatter. Twig gasped with terror. Something was approaching. Something he didn't like the sound of one tiny little bit. Puff, pant, squelch, clatter. All at once, the doorway at the top of the stairs was filled with the biggest, the fattest, the most monstrously obese creature Twig had ever, ever, ever seen. She, for it was female, moved her head and surveyed the scene below her. Beady eyes peered over her cheeks and the rolls of blubber around her neck wobbled. No peace for the wicked, she muttered. Her voice sounded like bubbling mud. Blub, 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 blub. Still, she added softly, shifting the mop and bucket in her hands. Gross mother's boys be worth it. She squished and squeezed herself into the doorway, wadge by wobbling wadge. Twig leaped to his feet, flew down the stairs and hid in the only place there was to hide, beneath the trough. The noise continued. Puff, pant, squelch, clatter, thud. Twig peeked nervously out. The gross mother was moving quickly for one so immense. Closer she came. Closer and closer. Twig shivered with dread. She must have seen me, he groaned and shrank back into the shadows as far as he could. And here is the gross mother. It was on the next page. 
The bucket clattered to the floor, the mop plunged in the water, and the gross mother began cleaning the mess her boys had left. In the trough and around it she slopped, humming wheezily as she worked. Finally she seized the bucket and threw the remaining water underneath the trough. Twelg... Tw uh, Twelg went. Twig yelped with surprise. The water was icy cold. What was that? The gross mother shrieked and began prodding and jabbing beneath the trough with her mop. Time and again Twig dodged out of the way. But then his luck ran out. The mop slammed into his chest and sent him skidding backwards out in the open. The gross mother was upon him at once. Ugh! She exclaimed. Vile, disgusting, revolting vermin! Contaminating my beautiful colony! She seized Twig by the ear, swung him up off the ground, and plunked him into the bucket. She then rammed the mop down on top of him, picked the whole lot up, and hauled herself back up to the stairs. Twig lay still. His chest ached, his ear throbbed, the bucket swayed. He heard the gross mother squeeze herself back through the door and then through another. The sweet, sickly smell grew stronger than ever. Suddenly the swaying stopped. Twig waited a moment, then pushed the mop aside and peered over the edge. The bucket was hanging from a hook, high above a vast, steamy kitchen. Twig gasped. There was no way down. Uh, here's a picture of the gross mother and Twig. He watched the gross mother wobble her way across the room where two massive pots were bubbling away on a stove. She seized a wooden paddle and plunged it into the simmering pink honey. Stir, 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 she sang. Got to keep it stirring. She then dipped a podgy finger into the pot and sucked it thoughtfully. Her face broke into a smile. Perfect, she said. Though perhaps we could do with just a little more. She laid the paddle down and heaved her massive bulk over to a shadowy recess at the back of the kitchen. There, looking out of place next to the cupboards and table, Twig saw a well. The gross mother seized the wooden handle and began turning. When the end of the rope suddenly popped into view, she looked perplexed. Where's the bloomin' bucket got to, she muttered. Then she remembered. Ugh, she grunted with surprise a moment later as she unhooked the bucket and glanced inside. I did forget to push the rubbish out. Well, put the rubbish out. Twig stared out of the bucket nervously as the gross mother lumbered back to the sink. What exactly did putting the rubbish out involve? He discovered it all too soon as a powerful jet of water so cold it took his breath away thundered down onto him. He felt himself spinning round and round as the gross mother swilled the bucket. Whoa! He cried out dizzily. The next moment, the gross mother tipped the bucket up and sloshed the whole lot, twig and all, down the disposal chute. Ah! He screamed as he tumbled over, helter-skelter all the way down to the bottom of the chute and out and... Psh! onto a warm, soft, soggy mound. And here are two pictures. There's the gross mother looking at the bucket and Twig falling down. Twig sat up and looked round. The long, flexible tube he'd fallen down was only one of many. All of them were swaying gently this way and that, illuminated by the roof of waxy pink which glowed far, far above his head. He would never be able to climb back up that high. What was he to do now? First things first, Twig thought, his eye catching sight of a wood sap still intact lying on the rotting pile to his right. He picked it up and wiped it on his hamelhorn skin waistcoat till the red skin gleamed. He bit into the fruit hungrily. Red juice dribbled down his chin. Twig smiled happily. Scrumptious! He slurped. And on to the next chapter, spindle bugs and milk scrubs. If you... That's reversed him. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Twig finished the wood sap and tossed the core away. The painful gnawing in his stomach had gone. He climbed to his feet, wiped his hands on his jacket, and looked round. He was standing at the center of a huge compost heap in an underground cavern as colossal as the colony above it. Gritting his teeth and trying hard not to breathe in, Twig squelched across to the far side of the rotting vegetation and climbed up to the, on the enclosing bank. He stared up at the ceiling far above his head. If there's a way in, he muttered grimly, there must be a way out. Not necessarily, came a voice. Twig started. Who had spoken? It was only when the creature moved towards him that the light glinted on his translucent body and wedge-shaped head that Twig realized how close it was. Tall and angular, it looked like some kind of giant glass insect. Twig had never seen anything like it before. He knew nothing of the underground swarms of spindle bugs, nor the lumbering milch grubs they tended. Suddenly, the insect lunged forward and seized Twig's collar in its claws. Twig cried out as he found himself face to face with a twitching head, all waving feelers and huge multifaceted eyes which gleamed green and orange in the dim light. And uh, here's a spindle bug. 
see a lot of them in the series. I got another one over here, the creature called. There was the sound of approaching scurrying and the spindlebug was joined by three others. I don't know what's wrong with the matter with her upstairs, said the first. Downright sloppy, I call it, said the second. She be the first one to complain that the honey was off, said the third. We'll have to have a word with her. Fat lot of good that'll do, said the first. If I've told her once, I've told her a thousand times. Vegetable, not animal, they all cried together and trilled with irritation. The insect holding twig stared at him closely. Not like the usual pest we get, it observed. This one's got hair. Then, without any warning, it lurched to one side and bit savagely into Twig's arm. Youch! Twig screamed. Yuck! squealed the spindle bug. It's sour! And what did you do that for? Twig demanded. And it can talk! it said another in surprise. You'd best get it into the incinerator before it can cause any trouble. Twig gasped. The incinerator? He wrenched himself free of the insect's pincer grip and dashed off along the crisscross of raised walkways. A shrill buzz of alarm immediately went up as the four furious insects gave chase. As Twig ran, so the underground landscape began to change. He passed field after field being hoed and raked by more of the guardian insects. Gardening. Wow. Further on, and the soil was dotted by pink spots of something beginning to sprout. Further still, and the fields were full of glistening pink fungus that grew like spongy antlers. Now we've got you, came a voice. Twig skidded to a halt. Two of the spindle bugs were in front of him. He turned. The other two were advancing from behind. There was nothing else for it. Twig leapt down from the walkway and raced across the field, crushing a swathe through the pink fungus as he ran. He's in the fungus beds, the insect screeched. He must be stopped. Twig's heart sank when he realized he was not the only one amongst the pink toadstools. The whole, f the whole field was full of l huge lumbering creatures as transparent as the insects, all busy grazing on the fungus. And here are the, uh, the milch grubs. Twig saw the chewed food coursing through the tubes inside the bodies, down into the stomach and along the tail to a huge bulbous sack filled with pink liquid. One of the beasts glanced up and let out a low growl. Others joined in. Before long, the air was throbbing with the sound of roaring. Detain the pest! came the shrill cry of the gardener insects. The milch grubs began to advance. Twig darted this way, that way, dodging between the massive animals as they blundered towards him. Slipping and sliding on the crushed fungus, he made it to the far side only just in time. Even, if he was sc even as he was scrambling up the bank, he felt the warm breath of one of the milch grubs as the beast snapped at his ankles. Twig looked around him anxiously. To his left and right was the walkway, but both directions were blocked. Behind him were the milch grubs, trundling ever closer. In front was a grooved slope which disappeared down into the shadows. Now what? he panted. There was no choice. He had to go down into the slope. He spun round and hurtled headlong into the shadowy darkness. Now he's heading for the honey pits! The spindle bug screeched. Cut him off! No! But with their massive honey sacks which they dragged carefully behind them, the milch grubs were slow. Twig soon left them far behind as he raced down the slope. If I can just... Twig thought. Suddenly the ground opened up before him. Twig cried out. He was running too fast to stop. No! His legs pedaled desperately in midair. Ah! He screamed and plummeted down. Plop! He landed in the middle of a deep pool and sank. A moment later, he resurfaced, coughing and spluttering and splashed about frantically. And, uh, here's that going down. The clear pink liquid was warm and sweet. It filled Twig's ears and eyes, his mouth, some of it slipped down his throat. He stared up from the sheer sides of the pit and groaned. Things had gone from bad to worse. He'd never be able to climb out. Far above him, the spindle bugs and milch grubs were coming to the same conclusion. Nothing to be done, Twig heard them saying. She'll have to sort it out. We've got work to do. And with that, as Twig struggled to tread water in the sticky liquid, the spindle bugs crouched down and began tugging at the teats of the milch grub's honey sacks. Pink jets squirted down into the pit. They're milking them. Twig gasped in amazement. The sticky pink honey landed all around him. Get me out, he roared. You can't leave me here. Blah, 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 blah. Twink had begun to sink. The hamelhorn skin waistcoat, which had before saved his life, now threatened to take it. Its thick fleece had soaked up the sticky liquid and become heavy. Down, 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 Twig was dragged, 
eyes open down into the viscous pinkness. He tried to swim back to the surface, but his arms and legs had turned to wood. He was at the end of his strength. Drown dead in rosy honey, he thought miserably. And as if that wasn't bad enough, he realized that he wasn't alone. Something was disturbing the calmness of the pool. It was a long, snake-like creature with a massive head which was just thrashing through the pink liquid. Twig's heart pounded in his ears. Drowned dead or devoured? What a choice! He squirmed around and kicked out wildly. But the beast was too quick for him. Its body snaked round behind him and the wide, gaping jaws came up from underneath and swallowed him whole! Up, up, up through the rosy syrup and out. Twig gasped and coughed and gulped down huge lungfuls of air. He wiped his eyes clean and for the first time saw the long body and massive head for what they really were. A rope and a bucket. Past the steep walls he went, past the group of angular spindle bugs, still busy squeezing the last drops of pink honey from the now deflated sacks of their milch grubs, and onto the upper reaches of the great cavern. The bucket swung perilously. Twig clung onto the rope, scarcely daring, though unable not, to look down. Far below is the patchwork of pink and brown fields. Above him a black hole in the glowing roof was coming nearer, and nearer, and all at once his head popped out and Twig found himself in the steamy heat of the kitchen. The fat, flobby face of the gra gross mother was directly in front of him. Oh, no, Twig groaned. Sweat rolled down over the gross mother's bulging brow and cheeks to secure the end of the rope. Uh, and here's Twig up through in the bucket. Her body wobbled with every movement, sloshing and slewing like a sack full of oil. Twig ducked down as she unhooked the bucket and prayed she wouldn't notice the crown of his head above the surface of the honey. Humming tunelessly, the gross mother slopped the full bucket over to the stove, hefted it up onto her trembling shoulder, and sloshed the contents into a pot. Twig fell into the bubbling goo with a squelchy plop. And, uh, that's that going down. Ugh! Twig exclaimed, his disgust drowned up by the gross mother's puffing and panting as she returned to the well for more. What's going on? The honey was hot. Hot enough to turn the clear bucket full instantly opaque. It gurgled and plopped all around him, splashing into his face. Twig knew he had to get up before he was boiled alive. He heaved himself up out of the thickening, steamy mixture onto the rim of the pot and splatted down into the top of the stove. Now what? he wondered. The floor was too far down to risk jumping, and the gross mother was already returning with yet another bucket full of honey from the well. He scuttled off behind the pot, crouched down, and hoped she wouldn't see him. With his heart beating fit to burst, Twig listened to the gross mother hum and stir and sip the pink honey as it came to a boil. Mm, she mumbled and smacked her lips noisily. Tastes a bit funny, she thought. She said thoughtfully. Sort of sour. She sipped again and hiccuped. Oh, I'm sure it's fine. She plodded off and snatched a couple tea towels from the table. Twig looked round him desperately. The honey was now ready. It was time it was poured into the feeding tube. Surely she'll see me, he thought. But Twig was in luck. As the gross mother wrapped the cloths around the first scalding pot, and heaved it from the stove, Twig ducked round behind the second, and when she plunked it back into place and went to empty the second pot, he darted behind the first. The gross mother, intent on getting the honey for her boys ready in time, never noticed a thing. Twig remained hidden as the gross mother struggled to empty the second huge pot into the feeding tube. After a considerable amount of grunting and groaning, he heard a ratchet clinking sound. He peeked out. The gross mother was pulling a lever up and down. As she did so, the long tube, now full of the heated pink honey, sank down through the floor and into the chamber below. She pulled a second lever and he heard the click and gurgle of the honey being released into the trough. A roar of gluttonous joy echoed up from the hall below. There you are, the gross mother whispered and a satisfied smile spread over her gargantuan features. Sup well, my boys. Enjoy your meal. Twig scraped the sticky honey off his jacket and licked his fingers. Yuck! He said and spat out. Boiled up, the honey tasted vile. He wiped his mouth on the back of his hand. It was time for him to make his getaway. If he waited for the gross mother to do the washing up, he'd be caught for sure. And the last thing he wanted was to be dropped down back the dis da ah, damn, dropped back down the disposal chute. But where was the gross mother? Twig squeezed himself behind the two empty pots and peered round. He couldn't see her anywhere. Meanwhile, the tumultuous racket from the chamber below showed no sign of easing up. If anything, it was getting louder, into Twig's ears, more agitated. The gross mother, too, must have sensed that something was wrong. What is it, my treasures? Twig heard her saying. He twisted round in alarm and squinted into the shadows. 
And there she was, her monstrous bulk sprawled out in an armchair in the far corner of the kitchen. Her head was back and she was dabbing at her brow with a damp cloth. She looked worried. What is it? She said a second time. Twig didn't care what was wrong. This was his chance to escape. If he knotted the tea towels together, he should be able to shin down to the floor. He squeezed back between the pots, but too quickly. In his haste, he knocked against one of the pots and could only stare in horror as it toppled over away from him. For an instant, it hovered in midair, before crashing to the floor with a resounding CLANG! Oh, me! The gross mother squeaked and leaped to her feet with remarkable speed. She saw the fallen pot, and she saw Twig. Blah! She screamed, her beady eyes blazing. More vertebrae than that my cooking pots! She grabbed her mop and raised it in front of her and advanced purposely towards the stove. Twig quaked where he stood. The gross mother brought the mop up above her head and... froze. The expression on her face turned from one of fury to one of utter terror. You... you haven't been in the honey, have you? She said. Tell me you haven't. Contaminating it. Adulterating it. You vile, disgusting creature. Anything can happen if the honey is soured. Anything that turns my boy wild. Boy's wild, it does. You don't know. At that moment, the door behind her burst open and a furious cry of, There she be! went up. The gross mother swung round. Boys, boys, she said sweetly. You know the kitchens are out of bounds. Get her! the goblin screamed. She did try to poison us. Well, of course I didn't, the gross mother whimpered as she backed away from the advancing torrent of goblins. Uh, now that this picture sort of spoils what happens next, but, uh, you know, strength the numbers. She turned, raised a flabby arm, and pointed a fat finger at Twig. It was that, she squealed. It got into the pot. The guile goblins were having none of it. Let's do her, they raged. The next instant, they were all over her. Scores of them. Screaming and shouting, they pulled her to the ground and began rolling her over and over across the sticky floor to the disposal chute. It was just a bad batch, she grumbled. Uh, ugh, my stomach. I'll make a new lot. Deaf to her excuses and promises, the goblins rammed her head down the chute. Her increasingly desperate cries became muffled. The goblins leaped to their feet and jumped up and down on a massive bulk, trying to push her down through the narrow opening. They squished her, they squeezed her, they pummeled and pounded her until all at once with a squelchy plop, the immense wobbling body of fat disappeared. Meanwhile, Twig had finally gotten down from the stove and made an immediate dash for it. Just as he reached the door, he heard a colossal splash echoing up through the hole. He knew that the gross mother had landed on one of the compost heaps in the great cavern below. The goblins whooped and cheered with malicious delight. Their poisoner had been dealt with. But they weren't satisfied yet. They turned their anger on the kitchen itself. They smashed the sink. They trashed the stove. They snapped off the levers and broke the tube. They sent the pots and stirring paddles tumbling down the chute and roared with laughter when a cry of, Ouch, my head, came echoing up from the cavern below. And they still weren't done. With a howl of fury, they turned on the well, hitting it, kicking it, breaking into a thousand little bits till all that was left was a hole in the floor. Get the cupboards! Get the shelves! Get her armchair, they yelled, and they pushed and shoved everything they could lay their hands on down through the hole they had made. Finally, all that was left in the kitchen was Twig himself. A blood-curdling cry went up like the roar of a wounded animal raging with pain. Get him! The goblin screamed. Twig spun round and raced through the door and dashed on the dimly lit tunnel. The guile goblins pounded after him. To the left and to the right, Twig ran. This way and that. On and on through the endless maze of the honeycombed colony. The sound of raging goblins gradually faded away to nothing. I've lost them, Twig said with a sigh of relief. He looked round at the tunnel, stretching away in front of him and behind. He swallowed nervously. I've also lost myself, he muttered miserably. Some minutes later, Twig came to a crossroads. He stopped. His stomach churned. There were twelve wheels leading off of it. Twelve tunnels, what? Like the spokes of a wheel. Which way now, he said and groaned. Everything had gone wrong. Everything! Not only is he strayed from the path, now he'd even managed to stray from the forest. And you wanted to ride a sky ship, he said to himself bitterly. Some chance, a stupid gangly little mistake for a wood troll, that's all you are. And in his head he heard the voices of Spelda and Tum Tum chiding him once again. He wouldn't listen, he never learns. 
Twig closed his eyes. A lost child once more, he did what he'd always done when a choice proved too big for him. He stuck his arm out and began to spin round. Which? What? Where? Who? I? Do? Choose? You? Opening his eyes, Twig stood and stared down the tunnel which Chance had selected for him. Mm, chances for the ignorant and weak, it came a voice that turned Twig's skin to goose flesh. He spun round. There in the shadow stood one of the goblins. His eyes glinted like fire. What was this new twist to the Gile Goblin's behavior, Twig wondered? Mm, if you want, if you do truly want to get out of the colony, Master Twig, said the goblin more softly now, you must follow me. So saying, he turned on his heel and marched off. Twig swallowed nervously. Of course he wanted to get out. What if this was just a trick? What if he was being led into an ambush? It was hot in the tunnel. So stiflingly hot he felt dizzy and sick. The low waxy ceiling oozed sticky drops that plashed on his head and slid down his neck. His stomach ached for something to eat. I've got no choice, he whispered. The goblin's cloak flapped around a corner and disappeared from sight. Twig followed. The pair of them walked along tunnels up and down flights of stairs and through long empty chambers. The air was rank with the smell of staleness and decay. It was hard to breathe and Twig's head spun. His skin was clammy and his tongue was dry. Where are we going? he called out weakly. I reckon you're as lost as I am. Trust me, Master Twig, came the wheedling reply, and even as he spoke, Twig felt a cool draught hit his face. He shut his eyes and breathed in the fresh air. When he opened them again, the goblin was out of sight. The next moment, as he ran out the corner, Twig saw lights. Unrelated to the light, but, uh, you know, there's that. And then here's on the next page, Guile Goblins. Sunlight! Streaming in through the towering arched doorway. Twig broke into a run. Faster and faster he sprinted, scarcely able to believe he made it out. Down the final tunnel, across the hall, and out! Yes! He shouted. In front of him stood a group of three guile goblins. They turned around and stared at him dully. All right, said Twig cheerfully. Do we look all right, said one. Our gross mother did try to poison us, said another. So we did punish her, said the third. The first one looked down at his dirty feet, at his dirty bare feet miserably. But we did act too hastily, he said. The others nodded. Who will feed us now? Who will protect us from the gloam glozer, they said. Suddenly all three of them burst into tears. We need her, they wailed in unison. Twig stared back at the dirty guile goblins in their filthy rags and snorted. You need to think for yourself. But we're tired and hungry, the goblins whined. Twig stared back at them angrily. So, he paused. He was about to say, so what, as the three unhelpful goblins had said to him before. But he was not a guile goblin. So am I, he said simply. So am I. And with that, he turned away from the guile goblin colony, crossed the courtyard, and marched back into the surrounding deep woods. And I'm going to cut it here. We are on page 125 and starting chapter 8. We are about halfway through the book now, which... At the current schedule, means we'll finish in, uh, you know, 2019. No, I'm joking. No, I am going to try to get more into this again. Uh, anyway, we'll see how that turns out. See you guys next time.